Oxygen is absolutely fundamental to life. Without oxygen, any organism will die fairly quickly unless it happens to be an anaerobic bacteria. But for humans, oxygen on an ongoing basis is fundamental. The most basic thing we can do for our patients is to ensure they are well oxygenated at all times. That's why we always teach the priority in any clinical care situation as being A, B, C. And the first two of those, of course, are airway and breathing. And the third is circulation that distributes the oxygen around the body. So oxygenation, absolutely essential. But sometimes things go wrong and we develop a condition called hypoxia. Now hypoxia means deficiency of oxygen in the cells of the body at the level of the tissues. So if a tissue is hypoxic, there is a lack of oxygen in the cells of that tissue. Now another term people often use is hypoxemia. And hypoxemia is different from hypoxia. Hypoxemia means deficiency of oxygen in the blood because it ends in emia. So hypoxia, lack of oxygen at the level of the cells and tissues. Hypoxemia, lack of oxygen in the blood. Now some people sometimes do use the term anoxia as well. Anoxia means the complete absence of oxygen. So hypoxia, hypoxemia, anoxia, the complete absence of oxygen. So let's just look at those terms briefly. Hypoxia, deficiency of oxygen in the tissues and cells. Hypoxemia, low partial pressures of oxygen in the arterial blood. Anoxia, an literally means without. This would be a state where there is no oxygen present at all. All physiological systems depend on a constant supply of energy in order to work. All physiological processes in the body need to be powered by some form of energy. And the way that cells produce energy is using a molecule which is energy rich called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And it converts this to another molecule called adenosine diphosphate. And when it does so, energy is released. Now, this way of using energy, this energy currency that cells use, is common to all forms of life. So crocodiles use it, dogs use it, plants use the same system, mushrooms, even bacteria, all use this ATP, ADP system. So let's look at this briefly here. So adenosine triphosphate is ATP. Adenosine diphosphate is ADP. And the phosphate units, of which this contains three and this contains two, are the PO4 3 minus ion. They are the phosphate units. And there is a molecular adenosine unit as well. So, what happens inside the cell? is there is some ADP and a phosphate unit is added to this ADP by the input of energy. Energy must be put in. And this forms ATP and water. And this works under the influence of the enzyme called ATP synthase. The enzyme which synthesizes ATP. And of course, oxygen is required in the production of this energy. So to produce ATP on an ongoing basis, oxygen is required. Now when the cell wants to use some energy, 
the ATP molecule is storing this energy. This is an energy-rich molecule now. And if this is recombined with water, then the energy can be released. And what happens is ADP is restored. The phosphate unit is liberated. And of course, the energy is released. And this energy can then power physiological processes. Without this energy, there is no ongoing physiology in the cell. There is no physiology, and in fact a reasonable definition of death is the absence of physiology. So this is, energy is absolutely essential for ongoing physiological life-giving processes. And the oxygen is absolutely essential to produce the energy on an ongoing basis to make the ATP. So the way we can think about this is here is a, an adenosine unit, a molecular unit, diagrammatically. An A DP, adenosine diphosphate, will contain two phosphate units. With the input of energy, a bond is formed between the third phosphate unit and the adenosine unit. So energy is put in to form this bond. This is the energy-rich bond. And then when the energy is going to be used, this phosphate group is given up is liberated, you're left with the ADP and the individual phosphate unit, and crucially, the energy which, which was in this bond, the energy-rich bond, gives up its energy. And that energy then does the useful physiological work. All the energy that cells used are produced in the mitochondria. Mitochondria is plural, mitochondrion would be singular. These, of course, are the powerhouses of the cell. The mitochondria use fuel molecules like glucose and fats. They add oxygen to them and they produce the energy. And the energy is produced in this energy currency of the cell called ATP. They produce energy. They are the powerhouses of the cell. Now, cells that don't metabolise very actively, like skin cells, might not contain that many mitochondria, maybe only 100 or two per cell. But cells which are very metabolically active contain many more. Now, what body cells can you think of that are very metabolically active? Well, muscle cells, obviously. Skeletal muscle cells contain a lot of mitochondria. Cardiac muscle cells contain a lot of mitochondria because they're having to produce a lot of energy. And the mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell, depending on a good oxygen supply. Any other tissues? Well, liver is metabolically very active. The liver is described as the chemical factory of the body, constantly undergoing metabolic chemical processes. And if you actually look at a person with an infrared camera, you see that the area where the liver is is giving off a lot of heat. The liver produces a lot of heat because there's a lot of metabolism going on there. A lot of energy is being used and a lot of mitochondria are needed to supply that energy. The kidney is also fairly metabolically active. There's a lot of active metabolic processes going on in the, uh, between the tubules and the capillaries. So capillary um, kidney cells also contain a lot of mitochondria because there's active reabsorption from the nephrons and there's tubular secretion going on, all sorts of metabolic processes using energy. Now, respiration is actually the term that means the utilisation of energy. So the mitochondria are the site of cellular respiration. And the chemical process used to achieve this is called oxidative phosphorylation. Don't worry if you don't understand this next bit, but what happens is that energy is used to add a phosphate unit to an adenosine unit. It is an oxidative phosphor phosphorylation. That is the way that energy 